Hey everyone, in this episode we'll be mentioning rape and sexual assault, so listener discretion is advised. Which was freedom? Which was tyranny? Which of the two superpowers was really the villain of this terrifying tomorrow? In a mad world where love is a sin and sex a crime, he had to discover quickly before the day of time stop. (laughs) Today on Dumpster Book Club we're talking about Time Stop by Philip Jose Farmer. I'm Sean. And I'm Mimi. And I don't know what this book is. I don't know what to say about this book. You know that thing called um, Twilight Anesthesia, where you have to be conscious and responsive during an operation, but it makes you, like, incapable of forming new memories, Mm -hmm. so you're just experiencing the pain and forgetting it? That's kind of what reading this book was like. (laughs) We didn't like this book. <laughs> well, what did you think of this cover? Uh, ugly. <laughs> weird. Um, Tell me what style this is. Tell me the style of art. <laughs> <laughs> Do you not know? No. I don't. It just looks bad. Okay, I, so it's pure green. Primary green. Just flat, solid green. And then within that, a picture of a green-tinted future city. Very, I don't what is this, like, 50s futuristic? I don't uh, know. Is it, like, Art Deco, kind of, or, like, uh, I don't know. A little. No. Anyway, there's our main character, I'm assuming. Who knows? It's just a guy. There's a guy. Just his face. Huge. And his body, it looks like he's wearing a shirt of brains. There's like a guy laying in the front. With a helmet. On an operating table or something, but without a table. Just laying. But the perspective is so bad. He looks like he just (laughs) got flattened. The perspective is really weird throughout the whole thing. It looks kind of like it was carved into a piece of wood in the Middle Ages. Yes. This is like medieval artwork. On either side of that guy, there's half of a naked woman. One breast on each side. (laughs) Uh, Behind them, there's two more guys with frowny faces. All the faces are super angular and... There's very hard black lines for all the details, but everything has a green yellow tint to it. So instead of popping out of the green background, it's just kind of like the green background is on top of a wood cut someone did. Like the green background wasn't on purpose. Something happened where it got <laughs> dropped into a green puddle or something. Uh. The back cover is solid orange. (laughs) Yeah, so our color combo is primary green, green green-yellow, and bright orange, I guess. I tried to look up Philip Jose Farmer, and I think the first line of his bio on Goodreads was like, he was born in Terre Haute, Indiana, but spent much of his life in Peoria, Illinois, and I got so bored. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that I couldn't read beyond that. Um, but I did go back and I found his website, which is the Brobdingnagian collection of all things Farmerian. Whoa. And basically he's famous because in the 50s he combined sex with science fiction and he won a Hugo for it. Thank God. Somebody <laughs> combined sex and science fiction. <laughs> Where would we be today? <laughs> yeah, he also is Wait, the- he just won a Hugo for 
doing that or was there a specific story? Um, I think it was for a book called The Lovers, which might actually be related to this book. I This is a loose sequel to The Lovers. It, yeah. <laughs> uh, and The Lovers won a Hugo. Yes. Oh, jeez. He also is a Nebula winner. He won the Grandmaster Award. For The Lovers also? No, uh... That was for something later, oh. I think. Is Grandmaster just mean you were you were gr- great guy? I think so. Actually, I don't know. That's what it sounds like. Some lifetime achievement in science fiction type thing. <laughs> I just imagine all these old frumpy judges in judge clothes. <laughs> so why won't any of these authors put any sex in their books? <laughs> I'm horny. <laughs> um Yeah, I looked up a little about The Lovers also, and uh, it doesn't sound better than this book that we read. The synopsis I read was in related to Time Stop, and it said, Like Time Stop, The Lovers is a story about extraterrestrial women being being transported around the world. (laughs) And it's like, that has nothing to do with time no. stop. Part of the reason I think we had trouble um, finding this book is that I think there's been a couple of duplicates. And it's also sometimes under different names, like A Woman a Day or Day of the Time <laughs> Stop. Um, the, yeah, the main problem is Time Stop is not the actual title of this book. The official title is A Woman a Day. Which I would have never read a book called A Woman a Day for this <laughs> podcast. Yeah. But there's other names, too. And Time Stop seems to be the least common name. Which makes sense because Time Stop actually has nothing to do with this book either. No, not at all. There's no time stopping. There's no time travel. And the time stop does not happen in the book. It's just referenced. But also... All the different versions that show up online have different synopses, and they're all totally wrong. <laughs> well, f- to, to be fair, the synopsis on the back of this book is completely yeah. wrong, too. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're completely made up. They're not even based on anything that happens in the book. It's, it's ridiculous. So when we pick a book, we usually look at the cover, glance through the back... And then maybe look it up on the internet, make sure it's not some big science fiction book we should already know and has probably already been covered a bunch. Um, And make sure it's not a sequel, if possible. But... But sometimes it's not your fault. (laughs) (laughs) I think if I had taken the time to just, like, read the first page or two, I would have put this down and never opened it ever again. I think that wouldn't work for me because that crosses my mind every time we start a book for this podcast. (laughs) So I can't, once I start, I have to keep going or I'll never read any of them. What I thought was really interesting about this book is it was originally published in a magazine called Galaxy Publishing. That's when it was first published. And it was in the later era of Galaxy Publishing when it had been taken over by some other company. They were notorious for editing the stories without the author's permission, specifically to add sexual content to the (laughs) stories. Did they do that here? It doesn't say. They were just a publishing house known for doing that. So either they added a bunch of sexual content or it already had all of it, and it was right up their alley. Okay. (sighs) All right. Well... Chapter it, one. Yeah, this book doesn't really beat around the bush. It starts with probably the worst opening I've ever experienced <laughs> in any form of storytelling. <laughs> yeah. On the one hand, I can kind of almost see like maybe what he was going for, but it's not some kind of spy thriller like uh. (laughs) but instead it's just like this bizarre seduction scene that 
ends with our protagonist committing a rape. So the way this book opens, the start of this book, the introduction to the universe and world and characters is our main character has discovered a woman spy in his room whose job is to trick him into having sex with her because sex is illegal. And then when he tries to have sex with her, a bunch of guards are going to come in and get him. But our heroic main character knows this and has already gotten rid of the guards. And this woman can't leave. This woman can't do anything about her situation. He just forces her to have sex with him. Yeah, so that she won't be able to betray him later. Because sex is illegal. He he holds it over her as blackmail. And that's how the... That's... Welcome to Time Stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, then there's chapter two, which is pretty bad also, because our protagonist, Dr. Leif Barker, continues his, like, string of sexual assaults. He's, like, harassing assistant or one of his employees or something which doesn't totally make sense if sex is illegal yeah but he has something called a lamic that is like a hebrew letter l badge that he wears that gives him some kind of high rank where did you ever figure out what this meant because i it was it, it makes him like Kind of like a priest, but he's also a doctor, but they don't have a church. They have a sturch. And <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> so this synopsis is going to be difficult <laughs> because I don't think either of us actually know what was going on in this book. <laughs> it was very challenging to understand. <sighs> so just kind of try to ride it out with us. <laughs> um. I think the Lamech means that he is above suspicion. He's already proven himself to be a completely pure soul, so he's he doesn't have to be investigated by the secret police or anything. Yeah. But, but, but why? Because <laughs> he's already proven it. <laughs> okay. He got his merit badge in purity. Well, anyway, right away in chapter two, though, let me just read a small snippet here. He grinned at her and said, I'm taking unfair advantage of you because I'm a lamech wearer. On the other hand, what's the use of being one if you can't take advantage of it? <laughs> And then immediately compare. Imagine, imagine any other authority figure just saying that to someone. Yeah. What's the use of being a cop if I can't take advantage of it? <laughs> he knows what he's doing. He knows that it's bad. Everyone knows that it's bad. Why? Why, though? But then he, like, immediately compares this lady to a bad business investment. Though beautiful, she was more cold candy than warm flesh. The man who broke down her defenses would find that he'd have done better to spend his time elsewhere. She wouldn't be good business. The overhead would be large and the assets frozen. Um, and this seems like just uh, some weird, horrible discourse he's having in his head. But this is actually an important plot point that comes up <laughs> later. The fact that because sex is illegal, no one's very good at sex <sighs> because you're not supposed to be doing it. Oh, my God. Well, let's let's explore our our uh, hero, Leif, Leif, Leif. OK, so he's a, a doctor and a surgeon. The best doctor and surgeon. Oh, yeah. There is a self-proclaimed ladies man. But we already know in in which way. Basically a rapist. He is also super spy, ultimate tough, mega cool guy. Can do everything. So yep. smart. So great. So brave. <laughs> because he is a secret agent placed in this surgeon position. But more importantly, having the Lamech. So he's beyond suspicion. He's a spy trying to bring about the end of this country. Um. So with the setting, um, <laughs> it, 
<laughs> okay. So around chapter five, we get a full chapter of just, here's the background. And why wasn't this the prologue? It's nice when authors are able to kind of develop a setting throughout a story where things kind of grow or build or you discover the world. Mm -hmm. Um, But this chapter wasn't anything like that. It was just, I'll just wait until chapter five and then I'll dump the history of the world interrupting like the scenes that were happening that were where there was actual tension just all of a sudden exposition i think actually his exposition took the setting and made it significantly worse yeah it's basically philip jose farmer read 1984 and horribly (laughs) misinterpreted it yes (laughs) (laughs) he read 1984 and learn nothing. Well, he read 1984 and thought, oh, what a cool setting. Yeah. Instead of at all trying to interpret what uh, Orwell meant or why he wrote this book, he just <laughs> thought, oh, how cool. I could write a story like that. Okay, so this is the post, post-apocalypse um, where most of the Earth has been wiped out by disease. I guess. Is that right? I think it was disease. So certain countries survived, were like protected from the disease. And then those countries kind of like expand back out into the rest of the world that's been completely devastated. So it's kind of like the creation of new superpowers of like, combinations of countries that he imagined would team up it goes on and on about which countries survived and which teamed up and which didn't and it doesn't matter it would have been exactly the same if you had just said this is a dystopian society he's working inside of to try to tear down through its own mechanisms and that would have been fine we don't need to know that hawaii teamed up with australia and that their enemy is the larger african continent it doesn't matter but he has to tell us all these things because he thinks it's cool and it's boring it's so boring yeah and it goes on and on and on and it was like He created this whole, like, oh, mixed up world where all these different countries are, like, blending in different ways. But it's still, he's just so unimaginative where he's still relying on just existing racial stereotypes and, like, existing racism. And just, like, he can't imagine anything beyond that. And so... It's so pointless. I just, I guess I always imagine these writers as real writers where they spend years writing their books. (laughs) Probably not. No one spent years writing Time Stop. I'm pretty sure that there were things that he thought that he wrote down because he must have thought it in his head. And so the chapter made sense to him. (laughs) But there were multiple parts where like, I think a significant portion of what was happening got left out because there were some jumps that made no sense. I was baffled for most of the book, and it was very difficult to understand or to keep centered. Yeah, we just kept jumping from one thing to the next and like the transitions, why something was happening just weren't, it wasn't there. Okay, okay, but we're, well, we're jumping around. Okay, now. all right. <laughs> uh, uh, the other important, not important bit of exposition is that there's a thing called time stop. There's a whole religion in this country that he's in where some guy is traveling through time. When he's done, he's going to appear and all of time will stop and everyone will be given their own universe to be the emperor of so there was no real explanation about why this was a thing or (laughs) how time would stop or why yes and it also didn't happen (laughs) in the story Uh, or have any effect on anything it's all just it's him sprinkling in details to expand his universe spoiler alert at the end the whole thing was a lie To trick people. So (laughs) it was a lie and it was set up by this other government, but it still wasn't a part of this plot. (laughs) 
and didn't affect any of the characters. So why do I care whether it's real or not? Okay, all these synopses mention this time stop like it's this impending thing that's gonna happen any minute so it adds tension to the story but i wasn't it supposed to happen like within the next 60 years or something like it was so uh, uh. (laughs) so that's the setting it doesn't matter that's what you need to know Sex is illegal. It wasn't even illegal because you can have sex for the purpose of procreation, but you're not allowed to enjoy it. Uh, But yeah, it was like it wasn't illegal. People were just really bad at it. There was an explanation about why people were bad at it. Because it was illegal. But it wasn't. (laughs) Uh, I it was not consistent even like even the basics like that. Is sex illegal or not? At some points it was not. Uh, Okay, whatever. I don't even... Let's get to the second mean. character in our <laughs> list of characters. <laughs> okay, so Candleman. Candleman is the head of the secret police. He's the he's the antagonist. I think he must have been introduced and for several chapters after. I was like, who is Candleman? <laughs> but eventually, yeah, okay, I got it. He's the bad guy. Yeah, he's uh, very driven, supposedly. I can't tell if he's supposed to be smart or dumb because it kind of flip flops. But maybe it's just because Leif is so smart. He's able to make Candleman look dumb. I think that. But also he was just like very devoted to his government. So could be blinded by stuff, I guess. Mm. I don't know. And then there's Ava. Ava. Yeah. Ava Leaf's wife. Mm-hmm. Um, who's also a surgeon or doctor. Yeah. And their interactions in their early chapters were pretty horrible <laughs> because Leaf was saying how they they how like they haven't had sex in forever. And he's always like joking around with her, but she seems to genuinely loathe him. <laughs> Anytime he's joking, it's like she has nothing but hatred and contempt for him. And she's also a secret agent. She's assigned with him. But she's also, it's repeatedly mentioned that she's basically willing to turn him in for anything that he does that's, you know, against their mission. Um And I believed that she would do it because of how much she seemed to hate him. It also seemed reasonable because Leif seemed to play pretty loose with his secret agent rules (laughs) and what he was allowed to and not allowed to do. Uh, So what do these characters do other than sexually assault each other? Leif gets a message that a lady has been in a car accident and he needs to do a switcheroo with her body to burn her body in the incinerator and replace her with a living woman who looks like her. And the way he gets this message is by reading someone's brain with like a lie detector machine that makes a little line graph But then you look at it and it's like that scene in the Matrix where they're just looking at the code and like, oh, I don't even see the code anymore. Just see, you know, like here's a sexy woman. That's that's the scene where he's like looking at a lie detector like graph and like he can just see the words that this guy's thinking. Right. So let let me try to explain. Okay. All right. (laughs) (laughs) Another secret agent comes in for an appointment and sends him a message telepathically through a machine that he's installed in his surgery room. And that's this guy's job is he's there to go get surgeries, but also send Leif messages telepathically. The message is that one of their secret agents, who is the wife of a very powerful person in this country, has died in a car crash. And they're going to replace her with another secret agent who looks exactly the same so they can still have influence with this person. And he has to go get the dead body, incinerate it, and make it look like this other lady was only injured in a car accident. Yeah. (laughs) That's what I said. (laughs) (laughs) Then he's confronted by four people that want their daughter saved. 
But then they, like, telepathically send him a message into his brain? Is that what happened? Yes. On his way to go switch the bodies, he's blocked by four strange people who send him a telepathic message to save their daughter who also died in that car crash. Or who was injured in that car crash. But then he just keeps going. He ignores them. And he's supposed to incinerate the body immediately. But he decides to disobey orders and he's going to do an autopsy. Why did he originally decide he had to do that? Because in the x-rays, things didn't look right. Okay, right. So he does this autopsy and finds some weird alien organs. Is she an alien? Is she mutated? Who knows? This whole scene was so annoying because he's like making all these conclusions based on zero evidence, but for the most part, they're correct. Just because. Well, she wasn't an alien. Well, he's like, oh, the replacement woman must also have this exact same organ because. And that's true. She does. I think um, it's also an important view into our author that the organs, I guess it's also important to the plot, (laughs) but the organs, it's an extra nerve inside the vagina that then travels all the way up to her brain. Uh, yep. (laughs) And I guess later we'll find out what it really does. There was a part in here that I could not figure out. There was another dead body that some other doctor was supposed to do brain surgery on where he did the brain surgery, but then the person was dead. So he carved the initials JC into that body's chest and left it outside the door for someone else to find. But multiple times people walk past this dead body, so I don't understand that either. And JC is the initials of some, a bunch of mysterious super spies that riles Candleman up a bunch, so he's just messing with Candleman. But why is this dead body here? Why did he interact with it at all? What does it have to do? Uh, I think when he was, he was going to incinerate Hala's body lady uh but then say that it was this guy but they left him out to be found (sighs) i don't know there was a lot of weird things with this scene because then there's a a third dead body yeah and he kills a guy and throws him in the incinerator and i'm not sure what happened there in the autopsy room But he wasn't supposed to incinerate that lady. Or he was supposed to incinerate that lady. He wasn't supposed to autopsy her. I I don't know. It I don't it kind of doesn't matter, except it kind of does because that's how Candle one of the ways Candleman finds out that he's a secret agent has something to do with this dead body. Yeah. But I I don't know. This whole scene was like just one gross thing from Leaf after another where he's like moving Hala's body and these were some of the jokes that he would do with Ava where he's telling her to strap down the Himalayas because the lady's boobs are too big the dead body's boobs yeah and he's just like really hot for this dead bod where it's like constantly talking about how good looking she is (laughs) and like but then later he also scolds himself for anthropomorphizing her, you know, like imagining that she's human when she's just a woman. I I think it was because he was like falling in love with the dead body that he was scolding himself. Kind of weird to just, just overall, this whole scene was very weird. And then also there's, um, that Thorleafson guy who is what, one of Candleman's men and he interrupts leaf doing something so leaf has to kill him and he does with like zero emotion no hesitation he has no remorse and he just calmly cleans up and continues with his business he's just acting like a serial killer like sociopath more than the cool guy that i think the author imagined him to be and then later he jokes about thorleafson after he's like killed him and incinerated his body where perhaps said leaf thinking of thorleafson's ashes being washed down the drains and into the sewers he's gone underground in pursuit of the frenchman 
Is that what you do with the ashes in an incinerator? Is put it, <laughs> flush it down the toilet? I don't know. <laughs> that didn't bother me so much in this scene because I just sort of imagined that he considers all the people of this country enemy combatants. So when he's allowed to kill someone, he just treats it as if he's fighting the war. I but- mean, even that, like, wouldn't there be some emotion of some kind? <laughs> Maybe. Uh... But... I think what bothered me is he leaves the operating room where the new Hala is her name lady is to go do this autopsy he's not allowed to do. And he's supposed to come back to be there with her. So he goes to this other room, does an autopsy, does a brain surgery, sets up a fake dead body crime scene, kills a guy, cleans up after this murder. So there's no evidence, which this was not a very, he got stabbed a bunch of times. He shot his face off or something. There must have been blood everywhere. It sounded very bloody. And then he walks. He did it all in like 20 minutes. (laughs) Yeah. So he goes back to the replacement Hala and then has to break her arm so that it's more believable that she was in a car accident. Anyway, she looks identical. They trick Candleman. She's got those weird vagina nerves. And And her, her husband can't tell the difference. And then they go have dinner at his place. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So this is something Danto and the dinner at his house is really funny because when Leaf is there, he's like, oh, hey, while you're here, can you get rid of this tumor that I have since you're a surgeon? And he's like, sure. So just sets up a home surgery, which is an important plot point. Because... Well, it's at Leaf's home, which is also his surgery office. Oh, I thought it was at Danto's home. Because, <laughs> well, it's still <laughs> funny because Leaf wakes up in the morning and then walks out and sexually harasses his secretary in the other room. Uh, <laughs> Gets out of bed. Uh, okay, well, he gets rid of the tumor, but the tumor was planted by Leaf, and then he fills the hole with some kind of poison jelly that responds to a code word to turn into poison. The uh, level of technology is all over the place in this book, but maybe that's normal for 50s sci-fi. Yeah. Then Leaf, so I guess he runs into the people that had interrupted him. One of them is Jim Crew. Who has the initials of JC. And these are the Africans, one of the other powers in the world. And they are pacifists and they have telepathy. But it's a really complicated form of telepathy that Philip Jose Farmer tries to explain to us many times in the book. And it never quite gets through. The way I interpret it is that you can't actually communicate telepathically, but you can use someone else's emotions to get a point across. Or like trigger a response of some kind. So like the message that they sent Leaf originally when they first encounter him, they didn't send the message. They just basically wanted Leaf to like think something that would cause him to stop or something like something that would get his attention. Mm -hmm. And so his brain came up with it. Okay, sure. Whatever. It's fine. It just there were pages and pages and pages explaining exactly how this works. But not very well. No. They, they're they also, like, depigmatized so that they can be in disguise. And they kind of kidnap Leaf, but he also kind of goes willingly. And they go through a bunch of tunnels and then to the, their secret hideout. And he does the surgery on the daughter and fixes her brain with, that's full of bone shards. They tell you that the girl that he saves can tell the future and that she had planned to meet Leaf. But that never comes up again. The girl is mentioned one more time in the book and it has nothing to do with her meeting Leaf or her telling the future and then nothing else comes of it. She doesn't predict the future or anything. They just say she can tell the future and she wanted to meet you. We don't know why (laughs) or what that has to do with anything though. Also, Leaf and Jim Crew take a shower together. There's a weird greeting where everyone touches them. Then after the surgery, there's like 
a weird love cult thing and leaf and the other doctor just run away from the scene Mm -hmm. there is another weird thing where leaf decides one of the women is named beatrice which is not her name yeah Yeah, that was weird but nothing comes of that either So Leaf runs away from this surgery and calls his assistant and everyone has gone to Canada to hunt aliens. Right. So there are aliens, which was shocking to me. <laughs> Hala is not one of them, even though that's hinted. Oh, no, no, wait. There, Of course there's aliens because some part of the history was that there was like a Mars colony and the Mars colony rebelled and they're the ones that sent the disease back. Oh, Oh. <laughs> but but that does that doesn't matter. But there's some alien humanoids that are imported for people to hunt the most dangerous game. <laughs> and I think it makes a reference to them being such dangerous game. And so that's kind of messed up. And in Canada, it is revealed that Candleman is the one who orchestrated the car crash to kill Hala because at one point Hala had sex with him and then didn't want to anymore and he was driven insane. Um, well, that's also kind of the reason she's such an important asset as a spy is because of this organ because it is, it's like she has just a vibrator. <laughs> inside of her vaginal canal that's what i imagined it was too oh uh so she can give people orgasms and they can't normally because everyone is so bad at sex so which as a secret agent she's supposed to use this power to gain influence which works very successfully yeah except that candleman then also successfully assassinates her in a car accident Right. Because of it. But good thing she had a twin sister and they go over all this stupid stuff where like they had to take out Hala's eyeball to create like a duplicate set of eyeballs so that the retinal scans will like not catch that she's a different person and like all these other things to make everything match. But no one actually checks. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. That whole scene was also ridiculous. Where Leaf decides that he's in love with Hala. For no reason. For absolutely no reason. Well, it's after he has sex with her, so I guess the thing no, worked no, no. on him, too. It was before that, because he's been, like, obsessed with her since he saw her hot dead bod. Okay. But then Hala decides that she's in love with him for no reason. After they have sex. Well, why'd she <laughs> have sex with him in the first place? And so they, like, go to a room somewhere to have sex, and then Leaf is, like, hiding, and Candleman shows up and barges in there, and he's, like, confesses to Hala that he was the one that tried to have her killed, and that he's glad that she didn't die in the car accident, because he doesn't know that he actually did kill her. And then he also tried to kill her again on the hunting trip, but he's apologizing for that too and then basically tries to apologize by raping her which is interrupted but also leaf very clearly specifies to himself in his thoughts that he he wasn't going to interrupt candleman except that he likes Hala, but otherwise he was just going to let it happen (laughs) if it was any other woman he would have just stayed in the closet but ava shows up And Candleman just runs out of the room and leaves (laughs) for no reason, saying nothing. Is this where we find out Ava's identity? Yeah. So it turns out Ava was a man the whole time. And... (sighs) Which at first I thought was supposed to be funny. It's supposed to make all the weird sexist jokes Leif make to him funny. But then it turns out to just be sad Because he has like a wife and a daughter back in the home country and he hasn't seen them for 10 years and he just wants to go home and he doesn't want to be a lady secret agent and Leaf is just mocking him all the time. (laughs) Uh, 
Yeah. It didn't make anything earlier in the book any better. But then Ava says that she's intercepted orders to kill Leaf or something or and then and then it's like, well, orders are orders, so I'm going to do this. Well, a lot of things happen at the same time. Okay. <laughs> Ava is sent a message from headquarters to take Leif in because he autopsied that body and because he met with the Africans. But then right after that, Candleman figures out who they all are. So they're all trying to escape and headquarters doesn't really care anymore. And he meets up with Hala to bring her with him because he loves her. Not because she's been compromised, but just because he, he likes her a lot. And they all run away to the sewers. Yeah. Well, they go to the headquarters. This whole time, I thought Ava was going to... I thought she was in the process of turning him in. But then she just doesn't. But they go back to headquarters. Well, the bad guy headquarters, not oh, their headquarters. Oh, right. Okay. So they go... To somewhere where Jim Crew has been captured and from outside the building, they do a telepathy beam and experience his torture. And this was like, it's like psychic torture. And I feel like this was pretty much just kind of ripped off from 1984, where it's like a very personalized torture that will basically turn people into perfect citizens, but they'll be a little bit brain dead. Um... But Jim Crew resists the torture and just dies instead. It's almost, though, as if he calls on a higher power. I feel like it was hinted that God killed him and sent out this, like, energy beam or something. Yeah, it wasn't super clear, so. But it doesn't it doesn't actually affect the story at all. We just know that Jim Crew is dead. And they run around in the tunnels for a while. All the Africans get killed eventually. They just get massacred. And they're like, well, we're all going to get massacred now. It's fine, I guess. Well, they all had one brain. What? (laughs) What? (laughs) Is that why they're telepathic? Yeah. They're they're like a collect. Africa is just one big collective. (sighs) Okay. (laughs) <laughs> Mimi's making a really <laughs> funny face right now. <laughs> okay. So then there's a final shootout with Danto and Candleman. Just, but obviously Danto has the poison jelly, so he's really easy to kill. But Candleman gets them. And there's, he has them like handcuffed in a secret room and he's going to do all his evil stuff to them and he's gonna he just monologues explaining nothing but filling tons of pages and then somehow he has too many emotions and leaf shoots him in the head but this part was so weird because leaf had been like handcuffed to a wall and then all of a sudden he has a gun and is shooting candleman and there was like if there was any explanation as to how he got out of the handcuffs or how he reached a gun it was not there i did not see it okay i can tell you okay all right so there's a small group of africans called the men in the dark who are driven crazy by telepathy and they just wander around giving people waking nightmares oh and one of these men in the dark gives candleman a waking nightmare and Leif takes his gun and shoots him. Okay, but how did he get unhandcuffed? Well, I think his handcuffs were in front. Oh, okay, okay. Well. And then they they escape. And after they escape, there's a very long exposition where Leif explains what time stop, the time stop event is and how he had planned it all. And it wasn't, it wasn't real. No one was traveling through time. And it was going to break apart this government. But that's going to happen in a, in a couple of years after this book. Uh, oh, but but not because of time travel, just like... Yeah, they were just going to decide when the, the time stop happened. And then they're going to send a bunch of people to pretend to be him, and that'll... The time traveler. Uh... But it didn't... Has another, this is a story about a girl. <laughs> <laughs> this is a story in which there's a secret agent... In another country that's found out by that country and he has to escape. That's the story. None of this other (sighs) stuff matters. Yep. That's it. The end. 
Why did this book feel so long? It was probably the shortest book we've read for the podcast. It was just so hard to understand. The nothing was handed to you. You had to piece it together. Only geniuses can understand this book. <laughs> I don't actually think this, but it's almost as if there's a huge conspiracy in this book because it's so convoluted and doesn't make any sense. But then there's like key words throughout that aren't explained in the book. So there's the Quo Vadis uh-huh. line and there's like JC and the Lamenc and all these other key words that come up in all these places that don't mean anything. Um, and then there's also, I don't know if you noticed the weird numbers. Yeah, I did. The page numbers. Some of the pages have weird numbers on them. And there's like numbers two through 10 that appear on some pages. And there's all these slight, like weird references to Judaism and old Christianity. And then there's also the psychic torture dream is so surreal. And I feel like you could pull all sorts of symbols out of it. This whole thing almost reads like this would be a book inside of a postmodern book <laughs> that some <laughs> like in Cryptonomicon, some guy would have to figure out the, oh the puzzle of this book. Uh-huh. Because there's something, it, it it makes no sense, and there's all these strange things that just don't fit in the book. It makes you think there's a puzzle here. But there's nothing. There's nothing like that. <laughs> this book was psychic torture. Can I share some of the really bad metaphors? <laughs> Candleman's eyes were gray nets, scooping up every detail of the penthouse. <laughs> Let me tell you, continued Candleman, leaning forward, moving his thin, hard lips like two lobster claws. <laughs> <laughs> Here and there hopped his thought, a kangaroo going no place in particular, stopping to nibble this and that tender bush. <sighs> I hated this book. I can tell. Um, I was thinking when Candleman was kind of going crazy about like there's all these different things that have the initials JC, which none of this mattered, but he goes through all these things. So there's like Jude Changer, Jim Crew, Jikiza Chandu. There's even um Candleman's initials are JC, but he's like going through all this stuff like, oh, everything's connected because these things have the initials JC. It really reminded me of those like early post 9-11 conspiracy theories that were being circulated through chain emails where it was like, oh, there's nine letters in this word and 11 letters in this word. I just... I think that's just more that fits into my theory that this is... It's like the crying of Lot 49. The, they're, you're always seeing the symbol of the horn. It's it's like a paranoid dream. Uh, I'm shocked by the number of reprints that this book has gone through. There's so many versions and covers and like... Does A Woman a Day make any more sense as a title for this story? No! After chapters one and two, maybe, like, I, that's what the trajectory I thought it was going down, but that, was, that didn't make sense later. Do you have any other thoughts? No, get me out of here. Well, who do you think this book is for? The only light in this dark, dark room of this book is imagining that this is an impossible puzzle. <laughs> I want... <laughs> Some great scholar who's very paranoid to go crazy trying to figure out this book. <laughs> That's who this book is for. Oh my gosh. Who do you think this book is for? I think you already kind of mentioned this, but I thought this book would be great for someone who really loved the setting of 1984, but thought it should be a steamy adventure with a happy ending. <laughs> But really, this book is probably for someone who gets tricked by misleading synopses. Yep, sure plenty of people got tricked. I doubt many people made it past chapter one and two, though. <sighs> well, next month is a very special episode. It's our one-year anniversary, and we are reading Planet Probability. <laughs> 
the sequel to Probability Man. <laughs> You've all been waiting for it. And it's here. <laughs> <laughs>